our main focus for this video is going to be about ATP. So one of the first important questions is what exactly is ATP? ATP's long name is just called adenosine triphosphate and I'm highlighting the A, T and P to just show you how it got its name. Uh, of course, students will ask me, do I need to write adenosine triphosphate or ATP in the exam? ATP is sufficient, okay? Paper 4 is a long enough paper, just the shortened form is sufficient. So just like um, any other biological molecule, you must know the structure of ATP. And here's the interesting thing. ATP is actually a type of nucleotide. If you remember nucleotides, they actually have three parts, which are the pentose sugar, the nitrogen base, and the phosphate group. But ATP is a little bit weird in which it actually has a particular sugar known as the ribose, how do I know it's the ribose sugar? Because in carbon number two, it has the OH group. Okay, that's the first thing. And it also has a particular base known as adenine, which is a purine base represented by the two nitrogenous rings. And another very important thing about ATP is it doesn't just have one phosphate group. It has three phosphate groups. That's why it's triphosphate. And adenine and ribose collectively together are known as adenosine. That is why the name is adenosine triphosphate. So you do have to know the structure of ATP for the exam. They may ask you to describe it or sometimes they, may, they might ask you to draw it out. So just be vigilant about what may happen. All right. So the next question that we then have to ask is what is ATP actually used for? Okay, in the future diagrams, I'm not going to draw out ATP in its, um, you know, that chemical structure on the left. I'm going to represent ATP as adenosine, represented as a rectangle, and the triphosphate, which are the three P's attached to the adenosine. Um, so, moving on, ATP is an energy molecule, and it's a type of chemical energy. Immediately, some students will be like, I don't get it. You are saying to me that ATP is an energy molecule, which is a chemical energy. But in chapter two of AS, I was also told, my students will tell me, I was also told that alpha glucose is an energy molecule, which is also a type of chemical energy. So which energy do I need? Because I've heard that glucose is a source of energy. Now I'm being told that ATP is a source of energy. So which is it? Am I being lied to? Is it all a scam? Well, no. Not exactly. There is a relationship between glucose and ATP, all right? So let's just draw out, let's just compare two of these molecules over here, ATP and glucose. Both are chemicals and both contain chemical energy. Now, these ATP and glucose molecules are inside the cell, represented in the, you know, the cytoplasm. Uh, and you can see the cell surface membrane, the phospholipid bilayer over there. So the ATP and glucose molecule are inside the cell, okay? And for example, over here, I'm drawing out a cilium, okay? A cilia, cilium is the singular form for cilia, okay? Cilia is, cilia are are plural and cilium is single, but in my uh, whiteboard uh, notes here, I did use the word cilia. So the cilia are important because what they do is they, in, especially in your airway, they are supposed to move the mucus upwards, okay, to prevent the accumulation of mucus. The point of the matter is cilia need to move and they need energy to move, okay? So which, so my favorite question to ask my students is, which molecule provides energy to the cilia? Is it ATP that provides energy to the cilia or is it glucose that provides energy to the cilia? Uh, based on my experience, 50% of students will say, well, ATP provides the energy. Uh, but some of my students will then say, no, glucose is the one that provides the energy to the cilia. So you see, if the glucose molecule goes over to the cilium, Okay, um, the, 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 the cilium is going to be like, uh, what are you doing? I don't know how to use you, okay? Like the glucose contains chemical energy, but the glucose cannot immediately give its energy to the cilia. 
So what needs to happen is the ATP is the one that is actually the usable energy required for cellular work. Because when the ATP goes over to the cilium, the cilium is like, ah, okay, I can use this energy molecule. Okay, so that is why ATP is referred to as the energy currency of the cell and glucose as the energy storage of the cell. All right. So energy currency just means that is the usable energy. Okay. So for any chemical reaction in your cell, like DNA replication, active transport, movement of the cilia, muscle contraction, whatever, they can only get energy directly from the ATP. So then you might want to ask the question, so what is so why do we say that glucose is also a source of energy okay i'm going to explain that in a while okay so just 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 bear in mind just just keep that as a just keep that at the back okay and we will talk about that later another way to talk about this is okay imagine like a, a note 10 ringgit over here that's the currency from my country malaysia and imagine a plate of fried rice 10 ringgit and the plate of fried rice also costs 10 ringgit as well. So technically, in terms of value, they are both the same value. However, can you eat the 10 ringgit note? I mean, you can if you wanted to. I wouldn't advise that you do so. But can your body directly use the 10 ringgit note as a source of nutrient? You can't. You, what you have to do is you have to use the 10 ringgit to buy a plate of fried rice, which incidentally, oh my God, cost of living in Malaysia is really going up. A plate of fried rice, 10 ringgit, totally ridiculous. Anyway, coming back. So uh, what happens is you, <laughs> you, um, you convert the 10 ringgit into uh, a plate of fried rice uh, by buying the fried rice, using the money, and then you eat it. It's the same thing with um, glucose, ATP, and uh, the movement of the cilia. The glucose represents the 10 ringgit. What needs to happen is the energy or the value of the glucose has to be converted into ATP, and then the ATP, which is the energy currency, can be, is the usable energy that can be used for the movement of the cilia. I hope the analogy makes sense, but we are going to look at it further in detail. All right. So then comes the question, how exactly does ATP provide energy for cellular reactions? So just drawing out the cell surface membrane and the cilium, and the cilium needs energy to move. So for the ATP to provide energy, the ATP needs to undergo hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means chemical bonds are broken down using water, and now one of the phosphate group has separated from the, you know, the main branch. And now it becomes adenosine diphosphate because adenosine is now linked or joined together to only two phosphate groups. So, you know, that's why it's called diphosphate plus the phos inorganic phosphate, PI. When you're writing it in the exam, you have to put ADP plus PI or P, uh, a capital I or a 1 is okay. Because if you just put ADP plus P, P is wrong because that uh, P represents the chemical element phosphorus. So in the exam, you have to put the word ADP plus PI just to tell the examiner that that is an inorganic phosphate, not phosphorus. It's a little bit, nit they can be a little bit nitpicky, so just be careful with that. Anyway, coming back to this, when the ATP undergoes hydrolysis, it releases energy and that energy is the one that is used for the cilium to move. Okay, so that's how it works. Story short over here. The ATP is full of energy and when it undergoes hydrolysis, it will release the energy and the energy is used for cellular work, for example, protein synthesis. As you can see here, the cell needs to carry out a particular work known as protein synthesis, like for example, transcription, translation. Now comes a more important question. You see, imagine inside a cell, the ATP is represented as those red dots, okay? So as ATP undergoes hydrolysis, notice what happens to the amount of ATP inside the cell the amount of ATP inside the cell reduces. So now the cell no longer has any more ATP. So if the cell does not have any more ATP, what happens? Um, 
is the cell doomed to die? Well, not exactly, because here's the beauty of ATP. It can be regenerated from ADP and phosphate by joining them together through condensation. But, see, when ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate, it releases energy. So logically, for ADP and phosphate to be joined together back into ATP, it needs to get energy. One of my favorite questions to ask students is, where does this energy come from? So if you're not sure, that energy comes from the respiration of organic molecules, for example, glucose. Because remember, I told you in the beginning of chapter, the, the earlier video, respiration is the breakdown of organic molecules to release its energy. The release of that energy is used to regenerate ATP by joining ADP and phosphates together. That is the beauty of ATP. It can be used, hydrolyzed, and it can be regenerated again. That is a cycle that is happening right here.